Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we are going to talk about five, why am I showing 10? Five awesome miniature or small sized orchids that I believe are quite easy to grow in a home environment. You don't need humidifiers, you don't need greenhouses, you can provide more humidity and all of that, but it's not really necessary all of the time for these orchids. All of them I believe are beautiful and I do believe you're gonna like them as well. So before we start, don't forget to give this video a like, leave me a comment, a share would be great. And hey, why not subscribe? I post videos every single week. With that said, let's start with my favorite at the moment. This is the Leptotis bicolor, which right now is my favorite orchid in bloom in my plant room. This little orchid, apart from being very tiny and cute, it has quite a large flower given the size of the orchid. And not only that, I think you can see I'm growing it in a swan planter. Yeah, she's really not very picky in what she grows. I'll give it if you're a beginner. This type of setup might not be ideal for you because obviously you cannot see when the medium is dry, you cannot see the roots, but once you get more knowledgeable with orchids in general, you can start to read the orchid without seeing the root system and you can use whatever planter you feel like. Visually, this orchid reminds me of a miniature Brassavola, and honestly, it acts like one as well. It is very, very drought tolerant. You can see the leaves are very succulent. They actually retain a lot of moisture. So if you leave this orchid dry for a few days, nothing bad will happen. It's not even going to show you wrinkles. However, it is a good idea to water it when you see that the medium is completely dry, pretty much like any Cattleya. Lightwise, it does also prefer pretty bright light, Cattleya type light. I would be careful with direct sunshine. In some parts of the world, it can be quite harsh, but honestly, I'm growing it under artificial light, which is bright. It's not a full spectrum grow light or anything. It's a combination of some LEDs with some kitchen light, and she's doing absolutely fine. She did not grow under natural light. So you're not limited to natural light. If you have bright artificial light, you should be just great. Temperature wise, again, she prefers things a little bit warmer, but I didn't have any type of issue with mine in winter time when things got a little bit more intermediate, let's say in my grow room. Generally speaking though, I would keep it more on the warm side. The medium, the planter, the fertilizer, doesn't really matter whatever you're using for the other orchids you can use for it as well and if you thought wow she looks so pretty well that's not all there is to this orchid the flower is actually super fragrant i was pleasantly surprised to detect that it has quite a powerful scent it's a combination between carnations maybe jasmine something sweet it's hard to describe the fragrance but it is absolutely beautiful and quite strong it only smells in the night time and particularly in the second part of the night early in the morning when i come to my plant room at six o'clock in the morning or so i can detect the scent in full effect but once the lights come on the scent is gone. So if you're sensitive to scents, maybe don't sleep with the circuit in the same room. In the daytime, there's nothing that I can detect, so you should be just fine. Now, fun fact, this orchid actually produces aromatic seed pots, very similar to vanilla. I've never experienced one, but reading on the internet, they are kind of a replacement for vanilla. They have a vanilla aroma. I can see that judging by the scent. It does not smell necessarily like vanilla, but it has a very sweet vanilla-ish undertone. So I'm seriously considering, maybe not with this flower because I really like it, maybe with another flower to pollinate it and get that seed pod and see if I can prepare it in any way. I need to research that, but yeah, just a fun fact of this orchid. It is sometimes used as a spice, just like the vanilla. Overall, very easy to grow orchid. I definitely recommend it. Now look how tiny it is. There are some versions of it which are just a little bit taller, but nothing like a Phalaenopsis or things of the sorts. She's even tinier than a mini Phalaenopsis. Next up, Telumnias, which again, I believe they are perfect orchids for home growing because they are very, very easy to grow, very adaptable. They don't take up a lot of space and they bloom beautifully. Mine is a little bit out of bloom. She's just producing some side branches now, but I did have my Tulumnias, quite a few of them in bloom about a couple of months ago. Tulumnias, even though easy to grow, they require a little bit of a different care than the Leptodes. First of all, 
even though they do still have succulent leaves, I find that they are quite a lot more thirsty than the Leptotis and less robust when it comes to drought. Of course, they're epiphytic as well, so they need a well-drained and ventilated medium, whatever might work best for you. And I do also believe you will do better with these if you water them when you notice the medium is dry, but in my experience, leaving them dry for way too long, too many days, will not really be to their liking. The leaves, they will close in to preserve water. You will find wrinkles on the leaves and generally speaking, the orchids will not grow all that well. With all of my Tulumnias that don't have a lot of roots and don't get hydrated all that much, I do notice much slower growth, reblooming, not even going to mention them. That's the bad part about Tulumnias. If your Tulumnia does not have roots, I think it will bounce back pretty easy, but it will take a lot of time because the growth is seriously affected by the lack of moisture, more so than other orchids like Cattleyas and Oncidiums, which for me bounce back super fast. Tulumnias take a while. Some of them took two to three years to produce a good root system, enough to grow normally and bloom. That's the only drawback. But other than that, they don't need high humidity. They like bright light, like a Cattleya, like the Leptotis. They like warm temperatures, but again, I have no issue in my intermediate winter with them. So I wouldn't worry if you are keeping your home in standard conditions, standard temperatures. And other than that, I would just not overthink it with these orchids. You'll find a lot of things on the internet about these orchids that they need to dry out between nighttime and things of the sorts. Don't, don't listen to that. It's, they're just a normal orchid, epiphytic orchid like anybody else. Don't keep the root system suffocated, but it's fine if it stays wet for five days. That's actually how I keep my orchids. But you have to work on ventilation. You can see I have clay pots, which breathe. I have a mixture of sphagnum moss and bark, which is breathable. You don't need to use clay pots. Just use normal plastic pots if you want with ventilation slits and you're golden. Just adapt to your environment, but don't overthink it. I do actually have a tutorial on them. Check it down below in the description. I just need to redo it because it's an old video, but definitely I would recommend Tulumnias to anybody. Next up, Neophoenicias, currently reclassified as Vandas or Vanda falcata. I like to call them Neo just to make a better distinction and not confuse most of you watching. Neophoenicia falcata is a very, very easy to go plant, which looks absolutely beautiful even without blooms. The one I'm showing you is a variegated type. There are so, so many types available on the market. This is Nishi de Miyako. It will mean something for some of you. And as I was saying, the leaves have these beautiful stripes on them. Not all of them look like this. Some look differently. Flower wise, you can have a bit of variation as well but they're all pretty tiny. Now, Neophoenicias are pretty popular orchids and there are entire groups of people dedicating their collections only to Neos. That's how much people like them. There is a really good reason for that. The orchids look beautiful even if not in bloom, but also the flowers are spectacular and are very, very fragrant in the nighttime. In a home environment, Neos should do absolutely fine. There is a little bit of debate when it comes to their care. I'll tell you my experience with them. Some will be easier to bloom than others. Some will do absolutely fine with whatever type of conditions you have in your home. Some will require a little bit more work. Which varieties? I'm not entirely sure. There is a high degree of variability, but this orchid, as I was saying, it is sought after more for its foliage than its blooms, actually. Care-wise, this orchid is not really all that similar to Vanda's. First of all, it doesn't really require that much light. It can be grown in bright light, but also there are some very reputable growers that suggest you give it pretty low light if you want it to bloom well and look good. I'm actually not doing any of those. I'm keeping them in rather intermediate artificial light. And as I was saying, some of them are just easier, bloom better, others not so much. And in the end, it's just the product of hybridization and how their genes got mixed up. Otherwise, they will not fuss about humidity. You should water them when you see the medium going almost completely dry in the growing season, but in winter, let them completely dry out. Don't really water them much at all. Just look at the leaves. When you see them starting to wrinkle, give them a light watering 
and then resume normal watering in spring when your roots start to grow when you see flower spikes forming that's when you should definitely water them more frequent and don't let them go very 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 bone dry they would much rather be a little bit more wet than dry in their growing seasons in spring and summer however even if you don't get these things right they are very very forgiving and you can absolutely learn as you go with these orchids i didn't ever lose a neophenicia not that i remember i have the same neophenicia for years which is a different one this is a more recent one it is a hard to kill orchid and i definitely recommend it if you're not necessarily interested in the flowers although they are really cute as well and as i was saying they are nighttime fragrant to me they smell a little bit like gardenias this particular one is a little bit sweeter but i had others that were just a little bit more soapy or spicy, I guess I would call them. Definitely though, I think I do enjoy the orchid more than the flowers. Next up, Oncidium Twinkle, one of the crowd favorites. Oh, it smells so good. Oncidium Twinkle is one of the most popular Oncidiums you can grow and for good reason. It is super fragrant and it stays rather small. You can see it's not a super, super tiny mini but it's much, much tinier than many other Oncidiums. And it has a pretty compact growth. It has tiny little flowers, tiny little flower spikes. Generally speaking, it's just not going to take as much space on your shelf. And bonus, it grows in normal household conditions. Now, this guy is quite different than all of the orchids we saw. It likes to stay pretty much kind of always a little bit damp. You can see mine is a little bit too dry at this point. I don't have wrinkles in the pseudobulbs just yet, but I need to water this guy. It will take over the pot with roots. It's a big root producer and it drinks a lot of water. Like most other Oncidiums, it prefers a ventilated substrate. It is an epiphytic orchid, but also quite a lot of moisture around the root system. If you fail to provide that moisture, what will happen is you're gonna have leaf tip die back, which is what I have here. Happens a lot, especially in the warm season for me. In winter, not so much you can see the foliage is nice but i do feel like i will skip watering day by mistake this summer and these leaves will start to have some dieback as well so for me this dieback happens in summer because i do have extremely extremely warm summers due to my climate in cooler regions this orchid should not have quite a lot of spotting but generally speaking the temperature should be intermediate to warm for this orchid normal home conditions should be just fine i have pretty hot conditions here it can withstand heat as well is just not going to look all that great and as I was saying don't forget to water it keep an eye on that medium on the root system make sure it's always slightly damp when you see the medium being almost dry give it a good watering maybe even soak the pot if you feel like your environment is too dry or too warm in that particular moment just maintain the pseudobulbs plump if you see wrinkles you need to water pretty much that's the rule Light-wise, they do prefer pretty bright light, but a little lower than Cattleya's. You can get away with artificial light. I grew mine in artificial light and it was absolutely fine. You don't need to put them in direct sunshine. Humidity-wise, again, it's not necessary. If you can provide a humidifier, it's not gonna say no. It's gonna appreciate it, but it's just not necessary. And the flowers, look at them. They're so pretty. Bonus, they're super fragrant. Very, 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 very sweet. A little bit sickening, <laughs> to be honest. But if you don't have a problem with sweet scents, this is a joy and it's a joy to watch as it develops because the stronger the orchid is, the more frequent it will bloom. It's a multiple times a year bloomer. Whenever a pseudobulb matures, it's going to be in bloom. I had mine in bloom for the holidays and the winter. Now it's blooming again because I have a new set of pseudobulbs uh, just maturing. So once you get it going, it will pretty much bloom every few months and the show can be spectacular with big specimens. What's there not to like? And finally, another miniature orchid that I think is worth checking out, the Arangus. And there are multiple varieties or multiple species you can go for. I haven't bloomed my Arangus fastuosa, but a few months ago I had not bloomed my other Aranguses as well, and it was a joy to watch them. They create some of the more fancy, let's say tiny flowers in my collection. A bonus, some of them are quite fragrant again in the nighttime. Hmm, now that I think about it, I actually showed you quite a lot of mini orchids that are fragrant in the nighttime. It 
wasn't scripted, it's just how it happened. Now, the Iranges, they're a bit of a wild card because typically speaking, Iranges do prefer a more humid environment. But I have to say, I don't have any issues with them, even in the summertime in my plant room, even without a humidifier. The only thing I need to do is make sure their root system doesn't dry out completely and stays dry for multiple days. I like to keep them aerated. I have them again in an epiphytic mixture, but I make sure that they don't remain dry way too long. And this is how I balance my kind of dryish and very warm environment in the summertime with what they like. They are perfect terrarium plants as well because they can handle and really appreciate the higher humidity. But I do believe you can get away with them in lower humidity as well if you maintain them properly watered. They are not highlight plants. I don't keep them in natural bright light. I keep them under artificial light, which is not all that bright, but it's not very dim either. And they have done pretty, pretty well. They're not fast growers. So if your worry is that you will run out of space, I don't think you will with Arangesis. And even though I consider them easy to grow, maybe if you're a beginner, go with some other orchids that I showed you in this video, not necessarily this one. They can be slightly, slightly more finicky, not way too much. And just to demonstrate how tough these orchids can be as well, I'll link you down below to a video in which I unbox one of my Arangis, I think, maybe it was this one? No, it's a different one. It spent a hundred days on transport, actually 99, but a hundred sounds better. Not even kidding, it's still alive. It's performing beautifully. That is how very, very strong and adaptable they are. Even with their love of moisture and high humidity, they still manage to survive and still thrive after that 100 days in a box experience. So even though they might not be as easy going as others, they're certainly very, very, very tough little orchids that remain tiny, bloom very nice, if one day you want to make a terrarium, these are perfect for a terrarium. So I find them very versatile, very tiny, definitely worth a shot. So these are my five picks for the day. If you do enjoy the series, maybe I can make more because I am actually focusing a lot on miniature orchids. I have pretty tiny shelves that, you know what, I kind of want to fill with beautiful little orchids. And having very big orchids implies a lot more hassle so i am actually focusing on tiny orchids i do have quite a few more to show you if you enjoyed this series let me know in a comment down below and i'll make more of these for now i hope that you found this video interesting and if you were thinking about some miniature orchids check these guys out google them learn a little bit more about them see if they might be the one for you and with that said Thank you so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you have a great day. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, updates, and other fun orchid subjects. If you wish to support the channel, do consider becoming a member or visit the merch store linked down below in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. It's always nice to stay in touch there as well. And I'll see you next time. Bye.